huge part of why why I built this. It's mostly it's like just about being ridiculous and doing things you want to do as a kid. It's all about, you know, just doing fun things and the kind of stuff you always dreamed about doing as a kid and like it's a pretty significant part of my life is believing that you shouldn't stop doing that. The ladder, this was always meant to be temporary, but I've never had a reason to finish it, so it became permanent. Until it rots out, that is. But the, uh, the real party piece is... This was gonna be the fourth treehouse that I or we had collectively built. We're always trying to design better ways of attaching it to the tree, like just less invasive to the tree, more flexible for the wind, because wind is a big thing around here. And this tree moves a lot when the wind blows, and especially this high up. And we were just thinking about how to allow the tree to bend, because if you stop it from bending, it might break. And one of our concepts was essentially to make sort of a ball joint at the top of the tree. So the treehouse was going to be all supported from the top of the roof. And we were kind of thinking maybe if it had like sort of a pivot where it could just kind of like rock back and forth as the tree moved and it would just stay vertical because gravity. And then I just was looking at the drawings and I was like, wait a minute, there's nothing to stop it from spinning. Like if we build this system the way we're thinking, the whole treehouse could just rotate freely. Like all we have to change is like two little things and it could just spin. We we're like, oh, we, obviously we have to do that. So that's how we built, as far as I know, the world's first and only two-story rotating treehouse. This is so cool. It's a really bizarre and unique experience. What's even weirder is being inside of it, because you can't see this happening. You just see the perspective changing out of a window, which is not really a normal thing. I just really like inventing things, you know, coming up with unusual, interesting things that have, as far as I know anyway, never been done before. As far as I know, this is the first bicycle powered treehouse elevator. It's been a while since I used it regularly, but I did actually sleep up here every night for two years. And this was my primary way of getting up here because it's better than climbing a ladder. Yeah, it's faster than the ladder, it's more fun, and the best part is you can serve 100% of your energy because... Free ride down. <laughs> the uh, ropes on that are like a natural like hemp fiber or whatever, and this time of year when it's extremely dry, it's all loose and floppy. I just didn't want to have a ladder just straight up into it. I wanted to make it more exciting. Just hold on to the rope, walk. Okay, but like this or? Okay, <laughs> I'm not that comfortable. Yeah, no, <laughs> gonna... Okay, not too bad. Yeah, oh, not too bad. And that, don't worry, the, the gap there is just this wrong <laughs> slid down. It's not like broken or anything. Okay. Yep. So I see a pretty high risk uh, tolerance here in this. Yeah, I mean, Property. if you think this is high risk tolerance, you should have seen me building it. <laughs> like, for a long time, I just had a 40 foot extension ladder leaned up against the side, but that's not very elegant and not very permanent. So I eventually built these bridges because I wanted to make it, I don't know, more interesting and exciting because, you know, why not? So uh, I built these two little platforms over here and then the two bridges. It just makes a nice experience walking into it. It's uh, makes the whole thing seem more, as people like to say, like an Ewok village. <laughs> I built it with zero safety equipment. I had a ladder 
and that was it. Just carried all the stuff up the ladder and thousands of trips up and down a ladder. That's what inspired the bicycle elevator. It was very done climbing ladders. As you're going down, obviously it's unspooling this blue rope cable from the rear wheel. That cable goes up and over a pulley at the top, which makes it twice the length of cable for the same distance traveled. So it makes it half as difficult to pedal, um, which was necessary to make it possible to, uh, you know, ride this with average leg strength. Yeah, so obviously uh, old bicycle. It was actually my mother's uh, old bike that I cannibalized to make this elevator. And then bits and pieces of random stuff, some old chain uh, from a motorcycle. This is a suspension link from the Subaru that I owned at the time. And then a piece of a coil spring here. So really just like whatever I had laying around at the time. Because I was on a semi-employed college graduate budget. It looks more or less like a bicycle still. The front wheel, of course, is completely useless. It's just there for looks now. But the gear system is essentially the same, the chain drive. I changed the gearing around so that it's significantly lower geared than a regular bicycle would be because when you start going up, it was way too much effort. This whole thing's built out of, as you can see, spare parts. These upright pieces are some suspension linkage from a Subaru that I owned at the time, a part that I replaced. Pieces of old motorcycle chain welded together to make supports. Bits of some old hand railing, a basket that I found in the forest. But other than that, it's just some support structures. So this cable here and this one here at the back, those are the stabilizing cables. Those go to the counterweight. They go across the treehouse, over some more pulleys, and then there's a big tank full of water there for weight. They have these very heavy duty steel brackets that have this flat plate and it has two small like deck screws in it. And that obviously is not enough. But right here, there's two tabs that go up that way and then have bolts through this roof structure there. So they're all very overbuilt. It attaches right back here behind me to the frame. And it goes over this pulley for mechanical advantage and then back down. And then it goes over this pulley here through the frame and then another pulley to direct it straight onto the wheel. And then it just spools around the wheel like a winch and lifts you up. The brake is still fully functional as a brake and it holds that rear wheel from spinning. As you're going down, obviously it's unspooling this blue rope cable from the rear wheel. That cable goes up and over a pulley at the top, which makes it twice the length of cable for the same distance traveled. So it makes it half as difficult to pedal, which was necessary to make it possible to ride this with average leg strength. As a bonus, when I lived up here, I got a good workout every night. I mean, very brief one, but kept my legs in shape. I love how the wood fits perfectly with the bike. Yeah, that's <laughs> another thing I've always been fascinated with is making things out of really bizarre shaped pieces of wood. So pick one that fit perfectly and allows you to get on and off the bike, but provides a hand railing everywhere else. So you wanted to get up above all this? Cause these trees are high around here. Yeah, I've always had a obsession with heights. Um, <laughs> the opposite of a fear of heights. I remember climbing trees as young as like four years old. When I was like 12 years old, I built a little tree fort. And then I always thought about making one that was like enclosed that I could sleep in, you know? Especially as a teenager living in a 600 square foot house with my mom and my sister. I was like, man, I'd be really nice to have my own bedroom. And <laughs> so when, I think when I was 17, I drew up some ideas. I was like, oh, I could build this little tree house. And I actually originally thought of doing it in the tree right next to the house. One of those, one of those giant trees down there. And then I was back here after college. I was, you know, working just kind of construction, handyman sort of stuff. And then one day I was like, that tree house idea. I actually had the time and the skills now to do it. I picked this tree partly because of location and also because of species. It's a Western larch, which is probably the second most durable 
species of tree around here. And then it naturally had no branches until like 50 feet up. And so the criteria for picking the tree was that I could build high up in it and that it was strong enough. But then the attachment systems that are generally used, I felt like drilling in deep enough into this diameter to have a mounting bolt and then having, you know, three or four of them around the circumference of the tree to hold up the whole structure. I was concerned that this tree would just snap off at that point because drilling an inch and a half diameter hole, like halfway through the tree, drilling three of those, makes a weak point. And also if I wanted to design a way of attaching a tree house to the tree without any fasteners into the tree. So I also came up with the idea for this attachment system, which is a giant steel cable that wraps all the way around and there's a there's a big bolt to tighten it so basically it's just an enormous clamp and the whole tree house is held up essentially by friction you just had to live here or were yeah you... so one of the reasons i wanted to build this after I, like at first i was just like oh that'd be fun i'll build a tree house because you know i have free time and then once i got a little bit farther into it i was like you know i can actually make this livable so that's what I did. And like I insulated it. There's two layers of insulation, different types of insulation on the floor, the walls, the roof. And you can see my high tech power supply here, an extension cord <laughs> with a uh, splitter on it for three outlets. <laughs> so yeah, I, I slept up here every night for two years. It's weathered a bit since then. It's been here for seven years now. Wow. You know, you can see like the floorboards are kind of separated a little bit and it's probably expanding a little bit as the tree grows because that is the downfall of my friction based attachment system is that it is just pushing on the tree with a large amount of surface area. And as the tree grows out, it pushes out on it a little bit. Conveniently, this tree grows very slowly. Time will tell how long it lasts, but when I built it, that was something I thought about a lot is that like nothing's permanent. I've done a lot of things in my life that make me think about that. Actually, within the same 12 month period that I started building this, that winter I'd built an extremely elaborate snow cave on top of the hill, just, just under the tree house here, basically. I piled up a large mountain of snow just by hand, just shoveled for like a week. I, I built this hugely elaborate snow cave. It had like four different rooms. Uh, some friends came over, we slept 10 people in the snow cave, like super elaborate. It was really interesting, the experience of being inside the snow cave, and it felt so safe and secure and solid. It was like a very primal thing, like living in a cave, you know, it just was like cozy and warm, surprisingly. I mean, when you have a good <laughs> sleeping bag anyway. That may have been like what one of the precursors of me thinking about things being not permanent. So you have the <laughs> ladder for the uh, more faint of heart. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the less experienced with climbing things. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't feel as nervous on this one. I probably should. But... I mean, it's it's the illusion of safety that really matters. <laughs> yeah. Here you're doing what? Yeah. So this is a steering wheel from an old car that we got at a junkyard with a little spinner on it, like people put on tractors. You can see here it's spinning a ring and pinion gear from a differential out of a Subaru. I used to own a lot of Subarus, so I had a lot of spare parts. So that's serving two purposes. One, it's transferring the force from this direction to that direction. And it's also a gear reduction. I think it's 4.1 to one. So for every four rotations of the steering wheel, you get one rotation of this vertical shaft, which is important because when you're moving a thousand to two thousand pounds worth of treehouse, it takes a lot of force. So it's all about gear reduction and leverage. So that's just the first of three gear reductions in the system. So there's, it's probably a few hundred to one reduction because obviously I'm spinning this hundreds of times to get us to do one rotation around the tree. So at the bottom here, Obviously there's just a large hole around the tree. We needed something to stabilize the tree house. So at the bottom here, we just have three tires. It's just like little wagon trailer tires. And they center the tree house on the tree, 
but they're soft rubber. So as the treehouse spins around, they don't do any damage to the tree. They just roll around and keep it stabilized and centered and keep it from essentially doing this. When they're not flat, you wouldn't be able to do this and have it rock back and forth quite so much. And that was like the whole point of why we built it this way so that the tree could flex. So you can see how much freedom of movement the whole treehouse has around the tree. So like the tree can move back and forth all it wants to and the treehouse just takes none of that stress. So my other treehouse has triangle, essentially trusses underneath it, supporting it. Triangles are a strong shape. It's easy to make things strong that way. Well, trusses in a roof are already triangles. They're just rotated a different direction and they're already extremely strong. So I realized that you can do away with the entire support structure underneath the treehouse and support the whole thing from the top because that structure is already very strong. And if you just make it a little bit stronger, then you can save a ton of weight by having all of it hanging from it. And also most materials, especially wood, is stronger under tension than it is under compression. And so this whole treehouse is supported from the very top of the roof. The only point touching the tree is right at the peak of the roof. And then everything else hangs down from that. So this shaft, this is the one that's spun by the steering wheel. And then we've got the smallest sprocket and then chain all the way across here. A chain is just a really easy way to transfer power and also have a gear reduction. So when you turn the steering wheel, this chain spins, it spins this one, and this transfers the power all the way up to the top of the roof where the whole attachment mechanism is. This is another motorcycle sprocket. I believe that's off of my motorcycle, which is turned by that shaft down below. And it runs this chain that goes all the way around the tree. And it's attached to little pieces of a motorcycle sprocket. So it acts like one giant sprocket. And this is where probably most of our gear reduction comes in. The entire structure of the treehouse is hanging off of just that steel hexagon ring at the top. So when it pulls, and it can't spin the tree, so it spins the treehouse around it. Uh, I mean, the force required for each rotation is very small, but when you have to do hundreds of them, it adds up. You know, at the end of the day, I'm still moving 2,000 pounds of treehouse. I'm just doing it over a longer period of time, so. Yeah, I always wished I had a reason to finish this. Like, if I didn't have the house to live in, if I didn't have dogs, if, if a lot of things, I'd love to just live in it because it'd be super cool to just be like, I'm tired of the view. I'm going to look at this now, you know, <laughs> and it was you'd be catching the sun all day long, right? Or the shade. And at this time of year, you'd turn it around. So your porch is in the shade and you can look out into the forest. And then in the morning you could have sunrise and you could have solar panels on one side of it and just turn it around as the day goes by to charge your solar panels. Also recently, I've just realized that I accidentally became an engineer. Like not really, I'm not certified or trained or anything, but I talk like an engineer and I think like an engineer just by accident. I didn't, you know, didn't intend for that to happen. It just did. <laughs> into cars? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm into pretty much everything. But lately, cars and anything fast and motorized has been the focus because that's what we based our YouTube channel on. That was one of our early projects. It's a Toyota Tacoma that was rolled and then abandoned in a field for like two years. My friend totaled this beauty. It's been sitting here for two years. If we can hotwire it. Which, by the way, we're hot wiring it because the key was lost, not because we're stealing it. Oh, wow. First try. First try. Ignition on. <laughs> we got a hold of it and hot wired it and drove it onto the trailer, <laughs> took it home, and then turned it into that, whatever, Mad Max rock crawler off-road thing. That started life as a very large lawnmower. And then we put a three liter inline six, a 2JZ engine in it out of a Toyota, basically a Toyota Supra engine, and put in suspension out of a Jaguar. Basically, we just come up with the most ridiculous and weird ideas 
possible and then make it happen with whatever we either have laying around or can get a hold of cheap. So there's another one of our early projects, the BMW truck. We call it the BMW Ute. That was as a BMW 3 Series that again we got extremely cheap and decided to turn it into a pickup truck because how else do you make a 1995 BMW exciting? Right, in the back yeah. there, there's some sort of Mad Maxi. That started life as a Honda Odyssey. It was, I think it's a 1985, or that's what it was originally. We got it as like a carcass of a vehicle that was rusty and hacked apart. And so we put a very, very large snowmobile engine in it that makes three times the horsepower of the original. I built everything else, built the suspension out of bits and pieces of all sorts of stuff. The shocks are out of dirt bikes. The axles and hubs are off of actually that Subaru Brat back there that was my first car ever. <laughs> I've become somewhat of a hoarder since we started this because like we build all of these things and obviously we're not close to town. So I'm always thinking of like, what can I use to make this work now without having to go to the store? This is a snowmobile that we turned into an ATV and that is an ATV that we turned into a snowmobile. We took all the tires off and we put skis in the front like a snowmobile and a track on the back like a snowmobile. How did you even, how do you know how to do some of these things? Uh, essentially many years of trial and error. I've always been interested in building things and like experimenting and taking things apart. Like when I was a kid, my parents would get me like old VCRs and stuff and I'd just disassemble them to see how they worked. So I've just kind of learned as I go and figured things out and you know, research it when I need to, but mostly just like, hmm, I wonder if this will work and then <laughs> make it work. And some of the things here are just things that we got for free that we haven't actually done anything with. Just like people, were, yeah, like this, it's half of an old Volkswagen bus that my neighbor gave me because he was like, I don't have any use for this. Do you want it? I was like, sure, maybe I'll build something with it. And maybe I'll just steal parts from it. Who knows? And that's the story behind the ultralight airplane back there too. That one in theory could work. I mean, I have most of the parts for it. It could be reassembled. It's just, I have very little fear when it comes to driving things fast on the ground, but I have zero experience with flying things. And it's, the consequences seem a little bit extreme, so. That's just uh, sitting there for now. <laughs> you use the Van Agel much? Is that synchro? Yeah. That's expensive, right? I mean, uh, well, I inherited it from my grandmother. Ah. No. So when she passed away, I inherited it because I was the only grandchild that could maintain it <laughs> and had a use for it. So yeah, I, I actually lived in it for like a while. And just last year, I put a diesel engine in it. So it's a lot more reliable and faster and better in all the ways. This is not the house I grew up in, but small fractions of it are. <laughs> um, there's a handful of boards and some of the outlines of the walls that are original and everything else I've completely redone. So it used to be 600 square feet and now it's 700 square feet. Bjorn, I'm putting you outside. You're too loud. Come on. This is in the same location as the house I grew up in, and it started out as that house. But once I took over the place, I started remodeling it. I started by just like fixing a few little things, and then one thing led to another, and half of the house was like rotten and had no foundation. So I tore from here over and from that wall back, like everything but this little rectangle here, I tore it off, I tore it off down to the ground and started over. It would have been easier to build a new house, but I didn't because this way I could live in it while I was doing it, and I didn't need things like permits and, you know. Looks yeah, like so, you re recycled a lot of the wood or just this? Yeah, no, that's, every board there has a story. A lot of them are pieces of the house that I tore down. This big footrest thing for when you're sitting at the bar, that's a post that used to be in the wall where this door is now. And then some of those boards were like siding from the old house. A couple of them are from like a, a neighbor's barn that got torn down. Like this is a piece of wood that a friend got for me. That. Is this tree? That's a, a cedar tree from the property here. It started life growing in the direction that it's at now. And then it got knocked over so that this was on the ground. And then this part grew straight up. And then I cut it down. It was not very healthy anyway. And then I turned it this way to be as a post for this beam. This, this used to be a wall here. Like there was just a doorway into the kitchen 
and then there were stairs. The stairs upstairs used to be here. But the point is this was a wall, and it was still a load-bearing wall when I replaced the beam. So I had to do all sorts of shenanigans to like prop it up and then put the beam in and then set it back down. And, um, I'm going to move this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> little, uh, the house is a mess anyway, but that's... And this is... This is my guest bedroom. The inspiration for this, I was in Jamaica for a friend's wedding at a resort, and they had this bar that was, it was out on like a pier out over the ocean, and it had little like hammock net things like this just out over the ocean all the way around it that you could sit on. We are all sitting there, and we were, I was just like, man, these hammock things are amazing. Like, I need one in my house, like just as a comment. And then I thought about it for like, 10 seconds and I was like, wait a minute, I need one of these in my house. The plan is eventually to make climbing holes like you'd have in a gym, so you can climb up and then into the loft. But I haven't gotten around to that, so at the moment you just climb up the uh, bar and then climb the tree into there without getting hit in the head by the fan. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a plate up here from last time I had somebody <coughs> spend the night. Anyway, so yeah, you climb up here, and then, you know, it's actually extremely comfortable for sleeping. And that, that was actually another reason that I wanted to build it, aside from it being cool, is that it's a one-bedroom house and I have friends that stay over. So I was like, hey, easy way to have an extra bed in the house. Because you just have crafted everything in your life at this point. Um, just about. <laughs> uh, and I also milled all of the lumber for the house and both tree houses. This beam, all of those beams, those are actually three by 12s. So you can only see three inches of them because that's what's sticking out, but they're 12 inches tall, three inches thick, 16 feet long. Wow. And they're all milled from trees that died. Yeah, and then some of it's original. Like these, these beams here are part of the original house. Uh -huh. um, they're one of the very few parts that's original. All the windows have been changed. That wall was moved. The bathroom was completely rearranged. The stairs used to be here, which made the kitchen extremely narrow. Yeah. And so now the stairs go up that way. They still kind of have the same layout as far as the bathroom is concerned. Like the toilet is, you know, under the stairs. That was the same. It was just that way. But this is probably the best, one of the cooler features. It's a cedar stump that I pulled out of the... There's a part of the lake where they collect all the driftwood. Oh, this is my secret medicine cabinet behind a photo. So there's a place where they like collect the driftwood that comes down the Clark Fork River and like funnel it out of the way so it doesn't get into the lake for boats. And so I went down there and just found this old cedar stump. So I brought it back and it sat around for like a year until I got around to working on it. But then I cut it flat into, you know, a square, which like most of it was just empty space. And then I made the top out of epoxy. Obviously I made a mold and I, it was upside down and I poured it into the mold and then put the sink on top basically. Wow, yeah. the mold part, it's almost like a jewel, like an encasted... Yeah, yeah, right? I really, like I've seen, you know, epoxy tables and stuff are really popular these days. Like I actually had the idea for this as a sink, like many years ago before the epoxy thing was popular. And I was thinking just cut the stump flat, put a piece of glass on it. But then the epoxy got really popular and that, you know, obviously made it better because then it's like all one... Something that I enjoy playing with is like, it's an extremely irregular organic shape that's totally asymmetrical and then you make part of it absolutely perfectly square and symmetrical and it just like exactly that's it's, the contrast yeah, right right it's the contrast it's all very flowy and swirly but then it's a perfect square i like it and i want to build a kitchen table like the same kind of style if i can find a really big stump i like the that's a crankshaft from a <laughs> This is, so this is a crankshaft from a 1961 Willys Jeep. This is the connecting rods and pistons from it. This is a flywheel from something else, but I just welded it together and made a bar stool out of it. Yeah. Stairs are great here too. That was a project and a half. It took me a day to cut these pieces of railroad track. This is a little chunk of like a narrow gauge railroad track that I got. So I cut it into these this shape, but because each one is a triangle like this and they all have to have this be the same, I had to make two cuts for every side of every one. And it's, you know, like a couple inches of solid steel. I have a saw now that would cut that in like a few seconds. At the time, I had to do the whole thing with an angle grinder. So it was like a day just cutting these pieces. And then of course, cutting these slabs of wood and then sanding them down and then notching them and measuring it all out and getting it all, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a. You never want to step into someone's bedroom unless you're. <laughs> yeah, no, <it> was, <laughs> 
pretend that the bed was still in. <laughs> oh, cool. The bed. the bed's great. Yeah, I, uh, you like can everybody. imagine who built that. <laughs> yeah, so that the bed's actually made completely out of recycled lumber that I had from various things. More random bits of engine pieces. These door poles are connecting rod bearing caps from an engine. <gasps> So everything doesn't have to be relevant to what it's supposed right. to be. Right, yeah, I like using things that are irrelevant. The fact that I do so many different things, I have all these things in my head of like parts that are laying around and shapes and sizes and all of that, it's all mixed up in my head. So I can be like, oh, I need a thing to open the drawers. Hey, there's this other thing that's that shape and size. I can use that. Also, it's just fun to repurpose. I like the three high windows give you the perspective of the canopy yeah, and it's just, it's also just for light because that's, yeah. that's east. So in the morning it lets in a nice, you know, morning sun, which is really nice, especially in the winter when it's long, dark mm -hmm. days. This used to be a really steep gable roof, like probably about that steep. And the walls, the roof met the wall about here. And then it sloped up like this. And then the ceiling was about here, <laughs> like about that much of it. Like it was very claustrophobic and it was an insane amount of work to just make it feel bigger. It also just makes the upstairs feel so much bigger and a nicer place to be instead of like a little cave. Is there anything you wouldn't build? Uh, I don't know. I uh, mean, house, climbing? car, <laughs> tree house, uh, um, yeah. Airplane, I guess, is about the only thing I haven't built uh, yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How old were you when you built your first thing? <laughs> Oh, I don't know, when I was old enough to pick up a hammer. I've been making things in my entire life. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah the, actually the original tree house that I built when I was like 12, that was the first real structure I built. There's, yeah, I don't think you can even, I mean, it's there, but you won't see it on camera. There's right over there in the trees, there's a few oh, boards yeah. still visible that you could not go into it. The tree is dead, it's all rotten, but it's, that was the first, probably the first real structure I built. All of this is the, old roof that I tore off of the house. Awesome. The, all of this, you know, lower siding there. Cool. So the patina is real. So it's- the, Yeah, it's, yeah, it's no, it's, it's real patina. Yeah, that's actual rust from when it was on the roof for 40 years or whatever. And it looks like you have another zip line that goes into the woods. Yeah, so this is the best zip line um, because you don't have to climb anything to go across and you also get to come back on a zip line. So I built a lot of zip lines over the years because you know tree houses and zip lines kind of go together and last year i was thinking about zip lines and how i have all these zip lines but i never use them and that's because they're extremely inconvenient like you have to climb a tree to get to it so in the spirit of doing things that you would do as a kid i spent a few days building some new zip lines that are extremely convenient like this one takes off right from my porch and my dog's gonna bite my ankle because he thinks I'm going to die or something, but no, <laughs> don't bite me. Wow. <laughs> so you're coming back? Yep. Okay. If you're not going to have fun and do the things you always wanted to do, then... Oh, he's over here. Why are you living? <laughs> <laughs> I had the wrong line. That's great. Oh my gosh. Also doubles as a clothesline if you need to dry some clothes. 